Well, hello everyone. I'm Bob Kendrick, president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City. And this is an MLB Network Radio Roundtable discussion, Baseball and Black America. Joining me today are Taylor Hearn of the Texas Rangers, Michael Givens of the Colorado Rockies, and of course, two-time All-Star D. Strange Gordon. Uh, and I'm just thrilled to be a part of this conversation talking about baseball and Black America as we get ready to reflect on the legendary Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I think it's an important conversation to continue. We started this conversation in, in such a somber way last summer after the tragic murder of, of George Floyd that we all witnessed and the impact that it had on virtually every one of us. If you had a conscious or if you had a soul whatsoever, that had to impact you. And while it was so sad that it took literally the loss of a life in such a vile, vivid way to get us talking about something that I think for those of us who are part of the Black experience of known has been going on for quite some time, it gives me some resolve that George Floyd's life was not in vain. The, these discussions continue. The optimism and, and the hope of change continues. So I'm, I'm really honored to have an opportunity to talk to three guys that I've gotten to know now. And Michael and Dee, of course, have been to the, to the museum on many, many occasions. Taylor, I'm looking forward to welcoming you to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And so I want to start the conversation off, and I, I, and I hope uh, I would like for each of you to just answer this question. We're going to play a little bit of a, a game. When you think of Dr. Martin Luther King, you think of what? Uh, and, and Dee, we'll start with you. Honestly, I think a sacrifice. Uh, I think a sacrifice because uh, he pretty much put his life on the line, you know, to fight for us. And that's that's big. Uh, I remember going to the Lorraine Motel 2011, right before I got called up. And I was just so moved, like I knew him. Like, I was like, man, you did so much for me. I don't even know who you are. I don't, I don't physically know you, but you did so much. So I think sacrifice. Taylor, when you think of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., you think of what? There's a lot of stuff that comes to my head, but I think the biggest thing with MLK was, um, to me, he was just an icon because of um, hearing, him, hearing him from like my grandpa, um, being the first African-American to do a lot of stuff in rodeo. Um, you know, he was, um, he, he got a chance to meet Muhammad Ali and everything. And I know that uh, whenever I was in Tennessee, or yeah, yeah, uh, Memphis. And I got a chance to, I haven't had a chance to go to the museum. I know that's a big thing I want to do, but just hearing a bunch of stories about his legacy and everything, I mean, I can't think of, I mean, he's, he's like an icon to me though. Yeah. And, and Michael, when you think of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., you think of? Uh, pretty much uh, like what Taylor said, like an icon, but a, a legend that uh, brought a lot of uh, unified things that he tried to bring to look at differences that we needed to look at. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I can only imagine because I was so young when Dr. King was assassinated. You know, I'm almost, I think five years old when Dr. King was assassinated. And for me, it, it hit home because my middle brother was an organizer for King's movement. And so in my little hometown of Crawfordville, Georgia, all the 500 people, my brother was kind of the connection between my family and Dr. King. He was an organizer and was organizing marches and these kinds of things in my little hometown. And even as a kid at five years old, I remember marching. You don't know really what this is all about, but you're marching and you're singing. And I remember the song, We Shall Overcome, and we're singing it and with, with every ounce that you have in your body. And, but the magnitude of this man hit home for me when he was assassinated because it was the first and only time I ever saw my father cry. Now this man was as tough as they came. 
And it was the first time that I'd ever seen him cry. And, and that left a, an indelible impression upon me. Now, for you guys who, you know, you come along and you hear about what Dee mentioned, the sacrifice that he made. And, and I think as we prepare for another day of service, you know, I think that's the message that King left us, the legacy that he left us, the selflessness that he left us, and, and a legacy of service, uh, a legacy of selflessness, because when you literally put your life on the line, and, and, and I do think in my hearts of hearts, he knew he was going to die. But he was willing to make that sacrifice for the greater good. And to me, that is something that hopefully we all continue to embrace and embody. But it, it really invigorates me to see young guys like yourselves who get it, who understand, who's grounded in that knowledge and belief of what that means and the service that you guys all provide and continue to provide. First of all, I wanna tip my cap to all of you guys uh, for the brilliance of the Players Alliance and the work that is going into that. It, it is amazing. I'm mad that y'all didn't come to Kansas City, but that's a whole nother story. We're talking <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing we heard, too. That's a, why we ain't going to Kansas City? <laughs> but that's all right. We'll take that up on another time. But oh, yes, the sir. Work, the work that you all are committing yourselves to do to support and help others, you know, it is so noble. And, and so my next question is, what motivates you in and around service? You know, because that is a trait of Dr. King. Um, I, I think what motivates me and when it comes to all these uh, things that we're trying to do to do great things is, is motivate me more about the young minds and trying to install the history and all the knowledge of the kids that what's going on, what's, what's been there. And I think being around in Tampa with a lot of history, with a lot of players like uh, Gary Sheffield, for, uh, Fred McGriff, that I got to be around as a kid and gave me their knowledge of the, the game and history of a lot of things. And I think seeing us in the Players Alliance and for Dr. Martin Luther King, we need to install to young minds and don't ever forget the history of what's been there before us. And I think that's a big, big important to me in what I do. Yeah, yeah. D or Taylor, either one of you guys. Uh, I, uh, you go ahead. Okay, uh, for me, man, it's 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 simple. Uh, I, we trying to leave the world better than we found it. We trying to leave the black baseball world better than we found it. We trying to leave, you know, our families with stuff better than we found it. That's literally it. That's I think that's everybody's goal to lead our black communities and show our black community that it can be better than the way you found it. And I think with showing not money, because the world does revolve around money. I think us putting our time and our efforts, you know, touching people, people need to see that, you know, especially these black kids need to see that, oh, I could be a black baseball player. I'm sitting right here. I'm looking at two black baseball players at a AAU organization, and they're the only two here. One of them's dad is a major leader, and there's still only two. See, we still got work to do. You see what I'm saying? That's what we're doing it for. for. Yeah. And, and Taylor, what about you? Um, man, it's, it's a lot though. But like, uh, I guess just growing up, we're always a family that would always be given and always trying to put a smile on other people's faces. Plus, I, I love helping kids. But the biggest thing I like is growing up in Texas and now being able to play for the Rangers. Um, you know, we never really, they never really had any like big, like African-American black guys that, that came through in baseball. It was always basketball and football, whatever it is in DMW. So uh, for me to be able to go back to schools and, and be able to speak at the youth academies and being able to, to do the players alliance and, and, and just being able to continue getting back is like huge for me. Cause I want the black kids to be able to see me and think like, hey, 
like, yeah, he plays for the Rangers and plays on TV and stuff, but he actually cares and want to, you know, help out a lot. So that's always been my biggest thing is trying to just let them, let the kids know that, yeah, like may play on TV and stuff like that, but I still, you know, am a personable person that easy to approach and want to, want to help you. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and I find that very interesting because one of the things that I oftentimes talk about with the Negro Leagues and the players of the Negro Leagues, you got to remember the context and the backdrop of the Negro Leagues. This was an era of American segregation. So it didn't make any difference how much money Satchel Page made or Buck O'Neill made. They stayed in the same neighborhood that I did. And the reason that was important, guys, and the reason that the Players Alliance is so important was an absolute brilliant idea, is now these kids get to see you guys up close and personal. And, and so when they saw Satchel Page at 18th and Vine, they not only wanted to emulate Satchel Page, the great baseball player, they wanted to emulate Satchel Page, the man. And, and it's hard to do that from a thought. And, and so the brilliance of the Players Alliance is that it now puts you in contact with these young folks. You become real. You're not just this guy I see doing his thing on TV. You're very real now. And, and, and as you know, in our game, it is an aspirational kind of game. You need to see people who look like you who are doing this and doing it successfully to, I think, dream about the possibilities. So yeah, they wanted to emulate Satchel, the baseball player, Buck O'Neill, the baseball player, Cool Papa Bell, the baseball player, but they also wanted to emulate them as men. And I, I think that is really important. And, and again, that's one of the reasons that I think that the, the work that you guys are doing with the Players Alliance is so tremendously valuable, maybe even beyond what you all recognize. You know, this is going to reverberate for years to come and again, I commend you guys. And so when the murder of George Floyd took place, we were able to do a very powerful conversation in and around it. And we examine areas around race relations in our country. And these topics are never easy to talk about. As a matter of fact, I think that if we, we sometimes believe that if we don't talk about them, then it's not happening but we know that it is happening and it's been happening for a long time and it is continuing to happen. And these, this dialogue is so needed. So when we start to now think about you all as athletes, particularly in a world where there are not many people who look like you, you know, you walk into a clubhouse where you may be one of just a few American born and I can only imagine the weight that you probably feel, and I could be wrong, when you have to now deal with these very sensitive issues with your teammates who probably, they really cannot identify with that experience. They can empathize. And, and, and I think they gain, hopefully, an understanding from what you all are conveying. But what is it like inside, your, inside the clubhouse as you had to deal with this kind of very difficult topic in and around race and, and, and our sport and race in society? Well, for me, uh, I kind of was always the guy who kind of stood up for that. And I kind of got in trouble a lot, you know, throughout baseball you know, kind of sticking up for that. So it was more of a moment where the guys who knew me really well, uh, you know, who aren't our color, they actually came back to me as stand-up guys and like, bro, I apologize for overlooking that. You know, I didn't, I really didn't know. I really been in my own bubble and I did not know. And, you know, what that mean, that meant a lot because uh, at least you know now. So now, like, I think a lot of us had in our conversations in our locker room, you know now. So if you do anything different, we just know how to, we know how to handle, we, how to handle you, yeah. you know, as a man. Yeah. Yeah. Tell well, you what is... <clears throat> now go ahead, Michael. 
No, uh, when I was at Baltimore, it was a lot of uh, subjects that we needed to come across to talk about. And like you said, you said, some of these guys didn't understand, but at the same time, now they know. Now they can completely understand. And I thought in my role, being around Adam Jones, a very vocal uh, leader we had with Baltimore, and he was my mentor, my leader. And since he's not there in Baltimore, I thought he's especially is my role as an African-American baseball player in Baltimore. And being living in Baltimore, we're, people, I get frustrated, the guys in our clubhouse, and I told them, we're in a predominant black neighborhood in Baltimore. We need to show and get, give the experience and show the love that we have in our community and express what's the knowledge in the, of the game and all what's going on. And, we had to get these uh, tough subjects to talk about to, to make people understand and no way understanding until we start talking about it. And now we have guys that cross baseball to now open their eyes to understand the truth of what's going out and what's going on right now. Yeah. Taylor, what, what was it like for you? It was, uh, it was tough. I ain't gonna lie because uh, I tried to, I guess, with me at the time, with me and Willie being the only two black guys on the team, we tried to approach it, I guess, the best way we could. Um, but I think I think one thing I also just learned and just would, would, would try to tell them was like, I'm a very open-minded person. I, I want to hear your side and your views on it. But fortunate enough, we had a bunch of guys that were, you know, a little on the fence and needed to get educated on it. And then we had a good amount that were open to it and asked questions. So I was like, you know, it, it was relatively a good mix, but like, um, it was tough though because you know living in Texas and in the South, you know it's, it's a little it's a little different down here. So um, you know I kind of kind of got to tread a little softly a little bit and pick my right. battles. So um, um, yeah, I try not to try to try to just keep an open mind with it. Um, got a chance to pick the brains of like a bunch of our veteran guys that we had here as well. So like a lot of them were actually on board with it. So it was it was good. So like I was very fortunate to be able to have good conversations with them. And I was like, you know, we're taking a step in the right direction, but it's like, it's a, it's one thing I'm never going to stop like not pressing about. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's always been my belief and I'm on record saying this uh, on many occasions that what we try to do in this quest for equality is find ways to seek commonality, you know, because very few folks can relate to my story in this country because we're talking about going from being enslaved people to this still kind of difficult challenge of finding equality in a country that is supposed to be the land of the free. So it's very few folks can relate to me being sprayed by water hoses. They can't relate to the police dogs being released on me. They can't relate to the police brutality that is still manifested to this very day in our society. But what I hope they can relate to is our success stories. And what you guys are doing is part of that great success story, that legacy of black baseball that has been such a prominent part of our ascent in this country. You know, you guys come from a legacy of some of the greatest to ever play this game. And one of my favorite posters in the museum says, 440 feet is 440 feet, no matter what color your skin is. And, and so your success in this game, the continuation of your legacy that stems from the Negro Leagues is one of the ways in which we draw commonality. Because I don't want my only image to be of me in that downtroddenness. I need you to see me in all of my glory as well. And, and so I commend those ball players who embraced this conversation. And even when we look at MLK, there weren't just black folks out there marching. Mm -hmm. It was when the good white people who had sat on the sidelines initially said no more, this is wrong. And then we started to see change because I still believe that if it's just us, then people will say, well, there they go. They're still complaining. 
They're still yep. complaining. And so to see your white teammates in particular come in and get engaged in this was very rewarding because again, in the NBA, is predominantly black. In the NFL, it is predominantly black. But in your sport, it's not. And, and to me, that was what was so meaningful to see the Joy Vitos of the world and those who started to voice out against what we were seeing. And, and I'm just curious, how did that strike you all as well? I'm not, I'm not gonna lie though, it was, um... At our player at the lines, it was pretty cool to see Clayton Kershaw coming out. Because, I mean, I think um, I think what a lot of people don't know, you know, he went to a predominantly, like, white school in Highland Park. So it was definitely good to see him. And then we had, you know, Trevor Story came out as well. I didn't even know he was going to be coming out either. So I think I think that's huge, you know. But, um, like, just referring back to, like, what we were talking about earlier, like, whenever we had that conversation with um, a bunch of our teammates and stuff like that. I, I try to make it known to the white players. I'm like, your voices are a lot louder than ours during the situation because it's like if you post the same thing I post, you're obviously going to get more views because you're in a predominantly white sport and it'd be huge. So, like, it was huge, though, to see guys like Clayton Kershaw and, you know, Trevor Story and, you know, coming out to the players' lines. Yeah, well, for me, like – like, like, uh, like piggybacking off what Tay said, uh, it's dope, man, because we can't, we can't get no change without them helping us. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So we're going to continue to need that from them. We're going to continue to need them to, you know, to back us up. And I love it. I love it because, like you said, it's predominantly white. It's a sport where it's only six to eight percent of us are actually playing. So we're going to need their help. And for them to see it and to be able to understand that that this is wrong, they're actually the people who stood up with Dar the white people who stood up with uh, Dr. King as well. And we just need a few of those to keep it going and keep it going so they can, you know, maybe do the same thing for us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Michael, what about you? No, it's just been really proud to see just what's been going on as far as what we're doing with the Players Alliance and now seeing our white teammates, it's like opening their eyes and like expressing like, man, like I want to be in that movement to help and make a change. And like Taylor and D, uh, just having them, we need them. We're all on the same world, same country, same land, same everything. We're all one. And like Dr. Martha Luther King says, like not about the color of your skin, but about the character of who you are. And right. we need to under, under respect, the respect of him and what his legacies meant through what he did to fight and express that we all need to be together. And I always express this to my foundation and what we do down, down here is, and we use our uh, model of strength through unity. With, our, with everybody's strength and power, we can unify and make a better world. And, and I think that is absolutely what Dr. King was striving for, you know, and, and we're, you know, this, this pathway to equality, this, and, and equality is also about economic empowerment as well. And, and I think when King's focus really turned to economic empowerment is really when he became in the minds of so many dangerous, because now you're talking about, again, this effort to, position black folks in a way in which we had not been positioned in this country. And, and so it's really interesting for me, and, and, and I'm just curious, you know, in the world that you all operate, I remember hearing stories from the Negro League players who particularly those who transitioned into the major leagues, what it was like for them, because they were walking into a clubhouse where nobody wanted them to be there. And so you had to absolutely prove your worth. And yet they still had this bond because, and that's what I see with the Players Alliance. So even though they were competitors on their respective teams, there was still this bond, but they all felt the weight of their blackness when they moved into the major leagues. Now it's years after Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier. He breaks the color barrier in 1947. So we're, we're talking 70, 74 years 
this color barrier has been broken. Do you still feel the weight of your color when you walk into that locker room? Oh yeah, for I'm, sure. I'm not, yeah, because I'm not lying. Because it's 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 tough, like <clears throat> walking in clubhouse and all you see, and like I, and you go in the stands, all you see is not your color, and it, it's tough. And it, and we have to go out there and do. I feel like sometimes got to do the extra to stay in this game because there's not many of us, and to just ball out like we done and done and we continue to and we're trying to express to the young minds and young kids that come out to play baseball but again when you don't see the guy next to you the same color it's 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 been uncomfortable but at the same time we have to express how this game uh, truly to express how uh how it is and why why we is it one of america's past best times of playing american game like a lion walking through the jungle, it's like everybody just stops and stares at you. <laughs> you know, right? It's it's they right, man. It's thank you. You got to think about it. I'm gonna put it a little deeper, and this is part of what the Players Alliance is trying to get as well, because it isn't just players. Uh, we walk in there. Think about if we walked in there and we seen a familiar face, a black clubhouse attendee. Uh, a black trainer, a black coach, somebody we can relate to when we have that feeling, but you don't. So now you in there by yourself. And like you said, a lion walking through the jungle, if you got to feel like a lion, it ain't a whole lot of people you finna tell, tell that you feeling sorry for yourself about walking in here with. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So that starts a whole no, new notion about, oh, you have an attitude. No, I don't have an attitude. I understand that. If I don't get this done, my family don't eat. Yeah. I don't. That's that's a big part that we have to get past because we need what are, we don't have black general managers that we can just walk up to and like, hey man, I'm going in the locker room and it's going down. No, that black general manager because it's so few, literally probably gonna tell me, hey man, you need to deal with that. You know what it's like to play being black and play baseball. Yeah. That's just how it goes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. you, always, you always hear that because at the same time, it's like, like D said, like you walk in, you have to, we have to put a lot of our pride aside because if we act up, we, oh. we look angry, we look mad. We, we're, we're something that we're not. We're just human beings that just out there want to play ball and play with our, our teammates and have fun. But again, we don't have, like I was happy to see uh, Dusty Baker back in the back in the league as a manager mm -hmm. and seeing his presence, seeing his knowledge, seeing his everything, and and to have to to hopefully have more black players and black managers, GMs, and whatever case may be. Sorry, yeah. sorry to cut you off, Mike. And uh, no, you good, Mr. Kendrick. But. Y'all ever even thought about Dusty getting back? Dusty had got a manager, couldn't get a manager job for three years. He only got a manager job because the team cheated their way to a championship. And he had to pick up the pieces because he was a strong voice, a strong leader. Why he couldn't do that yep. for just any other team? Why he had to come back and fix the, something he didn't even do? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm so proud of Dusty. He's a good friend of the museum, has been for a long time. You know, Dusty was there with Henry Aaron and, and with and the year that the Braves brought Satchel Page back. They brought Satchel back to help Satchel get his pension. And, right. and so, D, this is 1968, and the old man is, is believed to be 62 years old at the time. If you believe he was born in 1906, which I absolutely do not, but the Braves bring him back, and the Braves owner was a guy by the name of Bill Bartholomew, and they were trying to help Satchel get his pension. Satchel was about supposedly three, four months shy of his pension, and they bring Satchel and they hire Satchel as a pitching coach and slash trainer. Well, the old man gets the spring training, and he still wants to pitch, and, and, and they let him pitch. And fellas, Satchel pitched two innings in spring training and gave up absolutely nothing. 
Henry Aaron said he threw Damn me about right. He said he threw me a pitch that I stepped out of the batter's box and it broke across home plate for a strike. And, and but Dusty was there at that time, and Satchel's nickname for Dusty was Daffy. He called him Daffy Baker. And, and Dusty says, Satchel, my name is not Daffy, it's Dusty. He said, Daffy, I know what your name is. And, and so he was <laughs> he was there. So Dusty, Dusty's pedigree is so deep. And so, yeah, it makes me feel good that a black manager can get a job, lose a job, and get another job. Because we don't see that happen that often. Right. And, and I think about Cito Gaston. Cito Gaston won two World Series, fellas. He won two World Series. And so I don't care if Cito don't want a job. His name should have come up every time a job opening came about. But it didn't happen. Right. And so hey, you're right, you know, that yeah. hierarchy in our sport, we have to also make some changes in that area as well. Right. Uh, Mr. Kendrick, guys, I don't want to cut y'all off. I actually got some little black baseball players out here waiting on me. I need to meet them. <laughs> I love y'all. Hold on. Let me let y'all say hey to Mike real quick. I got to go, though. Mike, say what up to the board. What's going on, man? How y'all doing? Hey. What up, what up? <laughs> what up, what up, what up, fella? Y'all know how say what's up. Say what's going on. Right, say what's up. <laughs> it's the next generation. That's the next one. All right, y'all, I got to I gotta go. They are your way home. All right, D, appreciate it. All right. All right D. <laughs> Man, you know, and, and so I remember Buck O'Neill when Buck became the first black coach in Major League Baseball history in 1962. Now, you let that resonate for a minute first black coach in 1962 with Chicago Cubs. That's 15 years after Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier and the major league gets his first black coach. And Buck says that he was very proud of the fact that he had gotten this job and that the conditions, travel conditions, the money was going to be better. But he said, I couldn't stick out my chest because I'm the first black coach when I knew all of these other great black minds who were more than capable of waving a guy home. And, and so when we start to look at the Negro Leagues, all of these great leaders, executives, coaches, managers, they didn't get that opportunity. And, and to a large degree, we've seen that in our sport. And so now you're right. We have to try and change the dynamics of the hierarchy of our game to the point that we hopefully will get African-American GMs and African-American managers uh, because it, we know that it does make a difference, you know, to be able to be around people who look like you, who understand the things that you have to deal with. And, and, and so for me, I guess, as we kind of, continue the conversation. I'm gonna play another word association game, I guess. When you think Jackie Robinson, you think what? A freaking, honestly, a legend, an idol. Like, cause people, we hear the stories in this, but like at the same time, the, the fact that what he actually went through and Mr. Kendrick going into your, uh, going to the museum here and the, more and more I can go there and hear every story and it's it's like a new story to me because like everything that all the Negro League guys went through and Jackie Robinson himself we don't express it enough like he had to perform and people don't realize the what the conditions that he had to go through not just being the first African-American player to play the game he still had to perform he still had to go hit still have a family to go go home to like people don't realize you still we're in a clubhouse more with our teammates more than our families and being away from home stuff like that but like he is just a legend to me and I can't express enough like what he meant to me and what he means to baseball that what he went through and there's more stories that that should be 
told to these young minds and everybody, even my, myself at my age, to understand like exactly what baseball and Jackie Robinson means. And, and Taylor, what about you? When when you think Jackie Robinson, you think what? I think of a warrior. I think of somebody that um, how he went about it the right way and, you know, wasn't letting stuff phase him. Because I think um, when all this stuff started happening, I really got a chance to really just sit back and think about all the stuff that he went through. And it really put in perspective about me and made me think like, anytime I complained about something or whatever it is, like it made me think like, why am I complaining about something so small when Jackie went through stuff that was 10 times worse than what I'm going through right now, you know? So it really, it really made me think about it like that. Like, you know, just think like, man, like if he, he went through all that just to pave the way for us to be able to play this game. It's like, like, I don't, you know, I need to just shut up and stop complaining, you know, because I'm like, if I, if I went through stuff he went through, I mean, I, it, it would have been hard. It would have been hard. So that's why he's always a warrior to me, you know, and, um, uh, it, it, I mean, it, it's he's a hard steel warrior, that's for sure. Yeah. And, and I remember seeing the film 42. And, and I knew Jackie's story intimately, obviously, in the work that we do at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. But I ain't lying, guys. When you see this played out on the big screen, it made you, I think, appreciate even more how amazingly strong this man was. And, and what he also helps us realize for those who don't believe that one person can invoke change, well, you don't really need to look much further than Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Jackie Robinson. And the reason I associate those two na names is that they are two of the most important people in the civil rights movement. You know, we make the assertion that Jackie Robinson and his breaking of the color barrier was actually the beginning of the civil rights movement. And the late great Don Newcomb told me that they were having dinner. Jackie Robinson, Roy Campanella, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They're having dinner. And Dr. King says to them, that I don't know if I could have done what Jackie did. That speaks volume because Jackie Robinson was literally carrying 21 million black folks on his back when he walked out across those lines and Michael alluded to it. If he fails, an entire race of people would have failed. So, you know, the pressure of being the first and walking into an environment where nobody wanted you to be there but then also the pressure of having to perform with that weight on you. And, and so they are intertwined in my mind. And I, that's why we talk about the museum from a standpoint of baseball and civil rights. And after we had that conversation, Taylor, uh, last summer after George Floyd, it was, I guess if I was gonna take solace out of anything that occurred from that very difficult conversation and what we had all witnessed was people started to turn to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum for thought leadership. And, and that, guys, was with the understanding that this museum is a civil rights museum and it's a social justice museum. And, and so again, your voices are so needed. And you know, I know it's not easy, but it's important. And so as we continue to look at athletes and social justice, how important is it for you guys to continue to use your platform to speak out about these things when they, when they occur? Uh, I, think, I, I think it's a huge, huge thing that needs to continually happen. Um, and it's definitely something that never needs to stop, especially in baseball, you know, because there's not that many African-American guys that play in the big leagues. Um, so, you know, I feel like that's, that's something that we just got to continue always pressing on. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I think it was huge 
to uh, to see that a bunch of the white players came out during the players' alliance to help out. So, like I say, you know, we're, it, it's a step in the right direction. But it, it's it's one of the things where you can't you can't like, yeah, that stuff happened last year and stuff, and like you know, we can't let it like get faded out almost, you know. So we got to kind of always keep pressing on it and keep just keep educating kids. Because I, I mean, from what I'm starting to see as well, like the new generation that's coming up, these guys are like very open to to change and very open to a lot of things. So it's like we're obviously making a step in the right right direction. Yeah, Michael, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Uh, just is it important uh, with all of us in the Players Alliance and just myself? I felt the need of my platform and my community and things of the people that paved the way and to express, uh, to continue expressing and acknowledging everybody that the history and the, not to forget about a lot of, a lot of things that's gone through. And um, that's why even my kids and my foundation, uh, I'm going to send to the Negro Museum and I sent them to Cooperstown a couple of years ago because people can't forget the history, where we came from and especially using our platform and using uh, the history of the museums in Cooperstown, that it's it's important to keep striving to the right direction that we need to. Yeah, well, I, I, I tell you guys, it's, um, it's inspirational to see what you all are doing, the utilization of your voices and of your platforms when I know that it has to be somewhat uncomfortable. But as I oftentimes said, in our society, we have to become more comfortable being uncomfortable when it's about dealing and talking with race and race relations in our country. The racial gap continues to divide, unfortunately. And we have to figure out how we bridge that divide. And Dialogue is certainly one step in the process. So I commend all of you all for utilizing your voices. I hope that you will continue to utilize your voices. But do you ever just kind of walk in the clubhouse and just say, man, I so wish that I could just play baseball and not have to deal with it. Is there any time where you just say, I just wish I could just focus on my job? Well, I, I'm not, i am be quite frank uh last year i was pissed for a lot of things and a lot of things of like telling us asking us if we want to play or not and and i looked at my uh manager i spoke up and i said hey i just want to play baseball like bring the politics into this is this is not where it's supposed to be we have even our latin players that they live in third world countries leave, leaving their situation just to come to america and want to play baseball and expressing that we just need to unify each other and try to just go to the right direction because we're all we're all here doing the one thing we love is playing baseball and just to go out there and perform and entertain the fans and give them something to look for I think that's mm -hmm. the thing I'm um, hoping to continue to express and to hopefully make changes in making everything a better better day a better game yeah taylor what about you i think the same thing i think the same thing he said as well like just the way just the way michael said it was just last year was hard and it was tough i mean i mean i, I don't i mean i'm sure he felt the same way but it was pretty drainful like when you leave the field because like you know you, you're thinking about it and then it just talks about it and then you know we sat out for a game and stuff like that it was it was hard because you know there was a lot of people that wanted to have the conversations, but then like there was also, you know, guys that felt there's certain ways about it, you know, and it kind of drove a little wedge in between us at times. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was hard though, because I, I was the same way. I just wanted to play baseball. It was already <laughs> hard enough with COVID having not fans and everything, having those little cardboard cutouts. I'm like, oh, this is, <laughs> this is tough, you know? And I guess, guys, uh, one final thought from you all as we close out this conversation. And thank you both, uh, as well as Dee, for giving your time uh, for this and, and, and allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, any final thoughts that you guys have, uh, again, about your place in this game and the responsibility 
as black men uh, in this game and what that means to you? I think just um, keep educating, keep educating like the generation behind us and keep the stories going. I mean, honestly, Bob, if you ask me, I got the utmost respect from you because for you to be able to remember all them stories that you know, like it's it's crazy. Man. <laughs> I'm just like, dude, how do you? I'm like, how do you know all these stories? And, and like, it gets me fired up when you say them because I'm like, there's not there's not that many people in this world that can remember all those type of stories. And I'm like, these are like <laughs> stories about some of my favorite players that in the Negro leagues. I'm like, man, I could sit here and eat, you know. So <laughs> if it's anything, try to remember those stories that you say and try to pass them on down to my kids and on down. But I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to keep that memory like you, but I mean, you're gonna have to show me some tricks or something. How you do it? <laughs> and my uh, one about you. Nah, Taylor said it. I was gonna say say the same thing, uh, Mr. Kendrick. I know we express about Martha Luther King and Jackie Robinson, but we need to express more of you being the president of the Negro League Museum. What you mean to us and what you bring to the table. How much that you express and knowing all the stories. I, I told you from the beginning <laughs> of this conversation, I, I can go to, uh, I've gone to the museum multiple times to bring my friends and family. And I can hear your stories over and over. It's like a new new story to me. And um, for us to express how dearly you are to this game, and you are you are a face to, to me, you're the face of the, us black african-american players because you are the history as that continues to go and we just i'm going to do my best and continue to do my best in the tampa community and over major league baseball should use my platform and to to learn the history that it's been there and continue to uh, expire young minds and to have fun and express it to yeah. my daughters that i have yeah. i have two young daughters and to give them the a role model um, that they need in their lives and expect. Well, I, I appreciate you both for that sentiment, man. I enjoy what I do. And, and I hope that you all can use the legacy of the Negro Leagues and, and, and as fuel. You know, when it's going difficult. I will never forget when Ryan Howard would come to the museum and he would come every year before he would go to spring training. And it was almost like his rites of passage. Because as I think he realized that whatever took place when he got to camp, it wasn't going to be anything close to what those Negro League players had to endure. And I, th I think it gave him additional wherewithal to just keep on pushing on. A and I hope that you all will look at your place in this game in that same light. I thank you both for your time, for your insight, for what you continue to do to be a voice in helping bridge the racial gap in our country. I hope you will continue to be that voice. Keep playing this game, keep loving this game. And hopefully we will all, in the spirit of Dr. King, in the spirit of Jackie Robinson and all of those other selfless individuals who gave their lives to try and make things better. I think you all said it. We all have the challenge of leaving this place better than the way we found it. And, and that is exactly what you all are doing. I appreciate it. Look forward, I hope, to seeing you both in Kansas City this year when the season gets underway. So again, uh, from all of us at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, thank you guys for being a part of this conversation. No, we appreciate it, Mr. Kendrick, everything you do for us.